The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Well, good afternoon and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, The Future of Analytics, Measurement and Attribution is Closer Than You Think. We are excited to have the opportunity to connect with you all today. Um, I'll jump right in with some introductions. First of all, I'll give a quick introduction to our um, organization. We are from AdTaxi. Um, AdTaxi is a marketing agency that offers a full spectrum of services to promote your business in the digital space. I am Sherry Cosgrove. I'm a senior product marketing manager here at AdTaxi. And with me today is Brian Kroll. Um, Brian has been with AdTaxi since 2011, and he's our VP of strategic accounts. Um, he lives in San Francisco Bay Area with his wife and son. Um, and he really, he has an amazing depth of knowledge of both data analysis and coding um, that makes him just an expert at using data to inform and evolve digital marketing strategies that are really tailored to each client's goals and needs. Um, and that also really makes him the perfect person uh, to talk with us today about where analytics and attribution are headed. Um, so that brings us to our agenda for today. So on the agenda today, we are gonna start out taking a look at today versus tomorrow, kind of what's happening right now and what changes are expected. Um, we'll move into the great GA4 migration, um, lots of changes happening with Google Analytics, um, moving into the GA4 um, tools and things that you might need to know and how to be prepared for that migration. Um, we're going to get into a little bit of the cookie future as cookies are getting phased out. Um, there's some things that you uh, need to know, um, be aware of the impacts to your business and, and what the new options are. And then we'll talk a little bit about how you can get prepared, um, some tools and resources that will help you move into that future of analytics, measurement and attribution. So I will turn it over here to Brian and he can talk about where we're at today and what changes are coming up in the future. Awesome, thanks so much, Sherry. Alrighty, so let's jump right in. Um, there's a lot going on in this space uh, with, with how things are going to be changing in terms of how we measure and, and um, act on digital, digital metrics. Um, and so we'll kind of start with sort of like where we are right now and sort of where we're going and then we'll dive into each of these um, pieces a little bit later. So, you know, as it, as it stands right now, most everybody who uses Google Analytics uses a version that's, that's called Universal Analytics. Um, it's based on an older technology. Some of the metrics in UA, as I'll refer to it, are, are changing. Uh, and there's also some limitations on measurement in what you can do with UA. And so that's why Google is moving to what, what they're calling GA4. Third party cookies are something that are also going to be changing. So this is something where as it stands right now, they're basically ubiquitous for anything you wanna reach somebody um, with, with ad targeting and also measurement attribution. Um, they're incredibly effective, uh, but it's something where it, as an industry, there hasn't been a whole lot of consumer choice. And so um, things are changing in that realm because there's a lot more focus and rightfully so on consumer data privacy. Um, so what we saw with CCPA, which is California's version of their Consumer Protection Act, um, is just the beginning. Uh, there are five states out there in, in addition to California that have comprehensive data privacy laws currently. And there's also there's there's a slew of other um, uh, measures on ballots and also in, in progress in other states as well. Then you also have actions from um, personal technology players such as Apple um, also intervening into the space. Um, so that's sort of the, 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 the grounds, the, the, the landscape of where we are right now, but things are definitely changing. As I mentioned, GA4 will be sort of replacing, um, or would definitely be replacing Google Analytics, the, the existing universal analytics, uh, and it's based on newer technology that Google has developed, um, and it looks at things a lot more holistically. Um, it also looks at engagement differently. Um, Third-party cookies are going to be going away. So Google has changed this multiple times. So It'll probably, the, they've announced, the most recent announcement is that Chrome, which is the most um, widely used web browser in the world uh, in 2024, in the second half of 2024, uh, is going to be eliminating third-party cookies um, from local storage. And so that's sort of driven a massive race for a replacement, uh, but that's going to definitely cause some challenges for targeting and attribution. So we'll talk about what that means and, and sort of what is going on right now to um, to sort of work in, in line with that to kind of help out from an advertising perspective. 
Uh, and then there's also going to be increasing consumer data privacy, right? So um, the, all of this is sort of leaning towards how are we able to target consumers um, in a privacy compliant way and also measure those things but also provide more of a transparent value exchange for those consumers. And we're still expecting that, you know, it's, it's entirely possible that, that Google will do something with their app store, similar to what Apple did um, with, with theirs from the app tracking transparency that they released with iOS 14. But we'll dive into all of these things in detail here. And first we're going to start with what's probably going to be the most immediate impact, which is what we're calling the great GA4 migration. So, um, kind of a brief history of kind of how we got here. So in 2005, Google purchased a company called Urchin Analytics, and that became sort of the underlying tech for everything that Google Analytics started. Um, that was almost 20 years ago. And so the UTM that everybody uses sort of ubiquitous and tracking stands for Urchin Tracking Module, um, which is obviously from Urchin Analytics where that came from. And that's something that's been appended since uh, from digital advertising to URL so that you can kind of delineate sources of traffic and say, hey, this is what's coming from my social campaigns, this is what's coming from my search campaigns, this is what's coming from um, other referral sources. Um, that's sort of how everything started. And in 2013, Google unveiled Universal Analytics, and that became basically like the, the gold standard that everybody uses for measurement. Um, over 50% of all websites in, in the world is estimated use, G, use what we call GA right now, Google Analytics or UA, because it's free, it's powerful, but it also has limitations. Um, and it's 10 years old, right? So technology has changed a ton um, since this was released in 2013. So, the big announcement from Google, and this obviously is subject to change, they've delayed this in the past so that it's possible they'll do it again, but starting on July 1st, 2023, everything that Google is putting out there right now is that Universal Analytics will no longer be processing data. So it will still be there on websites. You will still have the ability to see your reports for a quote period of time. Um, and Google has not specified how long that period of time will be. But as of that date, that crossover date, new data is only gonna flow into what Google is calling GA4 properties. And so going forward, using GA4 is how you're gonna be measuring and evaluating all of your traffic to your quote, digital properties. So what is a digital property? So it's getting a little technical here, but there's some key differences in terms of how UA and GA4 are, um, are, are sort of appropriated. And with UA, a property sits under an account. And if you have, let's say you're a business that has an app as well as a website. So with UA, you technically need, unless you have um, GA360, which is an incredibly expensive um, paid solution that Google offers, you need a separate um, property for each of your apps and or websites. With GA4, it has the ability to merge all of this stuff. So it gives you a holistic view of events that happen across app and web data, which if you are looking at this from a UA perspective, there is no connection. So if someone could make a transaction on your app, you would have to measure that separately. If someone made a transaction on your website, you have to look at your data differently for how things come in. GA4 solves for all of that, and it gives you a much more holistic view of what's happening at the user level across all of your app and web data which is super cool. And that's really one of the key, key basics here also in terms of measuring users. So UA is really relying on cookies. And so that, that is essentially distilled down to session-based tracking. So it's happening when you're loading your browser, the cookie is happening, is passing data from that actual browser session to UA, and it's based on the session storage. Whereas with GA4, they're looking at a whole bunch of different, they're, they're, they're taking that into account, but they're also looking at what Google is calling Google signals. So it would be um, additional forms of identity. And that may be things where you are, let's say, signed into YouTube on your phone uh, and then looking at something um, you know, where Google recognizes that that's your device and that's your user. Um, they can incorporate that when you're doing something like watching YouTube videos and making a transaction. So there's a whole lot of additional signals that Google's kind of bringing to bear, which is going to lend itself to some incredibly powerful and very helpful tools for digital marketing uh, to how we're going to use this data uh, to, 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 to improve campaign performance and also just improve uh, knowledge and learning in terms of what's happening with uh, business from the digital front. 
And some of those things are, we, we know that we're going to see, because this is live right now, um, greatly improved custom reporting. One of the benefits of with, with Google GA4 is that there is a ton of custom reports that you can build, um, and you can look at a lot of different, you can look at your data a lot of different ways than you can right now in, in a, um, uh, a much more sort of customizable fashion. Um, and that's because you're getting also improved user lifecycle data. So you can look at sort of how people are converting when they first came in, what was their first conversion source, um, and to look, at, look at things like um, lifetime value. There's tons of new custom dimensions and events um, that you can bring into bear um, to your to your reports and and looking at things, slicing things different ways. So let's say from a uh, let's say you have a lot of different articles on your site, like a, from blog post or something like that, and you wanted to report on by author. Um, that's something that you can do now by tagging that up as custom dimensions um, in GA4 and you could say, hey, the traffic from this blog post and this author is, is performing much better overall um, than others. Um, you, the, probably the, the most important thing or one of the most important things would be that everything, the whole premise of GA4 is that by combining all of these different assets, um, the Google can bring all of their unique individual machine learning features at, at the account level to, to your account. So it's going to be able to look at all of the data and basically say, you know, these are places you should explore, um, which allows you can, you can get some really interesting um, uh, paths to see how people are converting. Um, what people are doing, you can look um, backwards or forwards up to nine different interactions for how people are doing from a conversion standpoint. What are the steps people took to convert? What are the steps people took after they converted to a goal? Um, that helps you with increased Google Ads integrations as well. So you can pass all these things over to use for Google Ads to learn from. Uh, and there's also um, uh, increased attribution reporting. So there's sort of you know standard um, in GA4, there's, there's three types of attribution models. Um, the, the first of which would be sort of like your standard attribution model. So it would be like first click, last click, et cetera, um, linear position based. Um, the, the second attribution model type would be sort of like a Google ads preferred, where it's going to look at more of what's happening on the paid marketing side. But then the probably the coolest one is um, data driven attribution modeling, which will be available in GA4, um, which I think is going to be a game changer for a lot of folks because it moves beyond sort of the traditional metal, um, uh, models and looks more at incrementality and is looking at where we can see the best results um, based on what's what's generating new and incremental um, business for for customers. So there's a lot of really cool stuff that's happening with GA4 um, and it's a huge reason why um, you know people should start you know digging in sooner than later because it's very very different than than UA um, and there's a lot there's there's just the, the metrics are going to be a little bit different, right? So you're still going to have the same amount of sales um, and everything that you would get as long as everything's set up the right way um, as in your current GA, but how if people get there, the breakdown is going to be a little bit different. And so the key difference here, I think breaking this down would be, it's really on measurement. Um, UA is just a session-based model, whereas GA4 is an event-based model. And that's really, I think the key bounce rate is something that's going away in GA4. And bounce rate is something that's been kind of like a problematic metric where a lot of times people will say, Hey, the quality of my traffic is poor because I'm getting, you know, a really high bounce rate. Well, if you have a single page app as a website where essentially someone can just scroll down constantly um, in, in regular UA, that's something that would count as a bounce, even though somebody could get all the information they need and spend 10 minutes on a page and then pick up the phone and call you and GA, sorry, standard UA would not necessarily recognize that and say, hey, this is maybe not a good traffic source, whereas GA4 is going to say this person converted, we should go find more of them. Um, and then also from a reporting standpoint, I think the, the coolest part about GA4 is it's going to be cross device and cross platform. Whereas currently in UA, there's limits on that. And there's also limits when you're looking at web and app there too. There's also limits. Well, I think Google's been testing this a lot in, in standard UA right now where they'll, they'll sort of put some insights out there. Um, that's limited. The promise of GA4 is it's going to use that machine learning at an individual um, property level uh, for each individual website and or app combination um, to really sort of enhance the insight discovery and it'll be ways for um, people who are really into digital analytics to learn a lot more about what's happening with their business and how people are finding them and, and utilizing their digital properties. So there's a ton going on with the migration to GA4. 
um, but it's a good thing. And you know, you need to prepare though, right? So there are some some are strong recommendations here for how to prepare. If you haven't already dual deployed, which is something you can definitely do, you should do it right away. Um, and there's very detailed instructions if you search the web. Um, we have some resources on our website that I'll get to in a second there. But basically, since everything's gonna be going away, if you're looking at any sort of year over year um, aspects of measurement for your business, like if you wanted to see what happened in um, May of last year and you're on GA4 and you haven't deployed it, you're not gonna be able to see that unless you download past reports. So you should also prepare because we're not sure exactly when everything's gonna go away and when the when you know standard UA is going to be um, completely deprecated. Um, I would highly recommend that you download any and all of your data for historical context that you may or may not need. Better to have it and not need it than to need it and not be able to get it. Um, definitely start building out once you get into GA4 new custom reports. Try and uh, one thing that's interesting is the sort of standard reports that are everybody's used to in in UA, something like um, under acquisition for source medium, that's not a pre-built report in GA4, um, at least as of right now. And so that's something where you wanna, if you wanna try and measure sort of apples to apples and see how things are different in GA4 versus UA, um, that's something you'll definitely wanna do to try and create those new custom reports to sort of mimic maybe what you were used to seeing in UA, but then also look at things differently, explore those custom insights, and explore those new custom dimensions, um, and start doing that as soon as you can, because the more that you can find that's relevant to your customer's journey, um, the better you can turn those into actions and deploy them with your marketing team. So there's a lot of good stuff here. There's, because there's a lot of good stuff, there's also um, a ton to do and it can sometimes be daunting. So that's one way that we can help here at AdTaxi. Um, we can help out with installation and or migration to GA4. We can help out with reporting and strategy, uh, resources and training, um, just overall expert support. And if you want to learn more about that, you can go to our website at adtaxi.com forward slash solutions forward slash GA4. And you'll find everything you need, including some great white papers, um, resources, et cetera, there for you. So that was a lot. Now let's talk about the next big change. And this is something that is, um, as Sherry alluded to, it's already sort of in motion. Um, but it's also going to be, I think, a really big change that people are going to have to kind of get used to um, when we're talking about what's going to happen with um, the, the cookieless future. And so this is something, like I said, that's been in motion for a while. Um, it's not really anything new, but it's going to be a big change um, in 2024 in the second half. And so this has started for a while. Um, anybody who uses um, Apple products and has used Safari in particular, um, Safari has had something that's called intelligent tracking prevention, where essentially um, it, it blocks cookies and trackers at your discretion um, already. Um, so that's something that's that's already in existence in in um, on 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 like you know desktop and uh, and um, uh, iOS for tablet. Um, when we talk about iOS for mobile devices, the app tracking transparency is something that was a huge game changer, where essentially um, people can ask your apps not to track. And it's something where Apple sort of put this into all apps through their app store, where you know, if you don't want, if you didn't want to be tracked, you could opt out at the individual app level. So I could tell Facebook, you know, that hey, I don't want to be tracked by you, but Snapchat's fine, or I don't want to be tracked by YouTube or whatever it would be. Um, that's something that's been out there and marketers had to adjust. But the big one is going to be what happens in, when Google Chrome starts um, uh, deprecating or not supporting third-party cookies in 2024. And this is this is really sort of like the big announcement. Um, it's incredibly important because most of how ads are targeted and measured right now um, are through third-party cookies, at least when we're talking about display, social, et cetera. And so this is something that's definitely going to impact people's businesses. And before we get into sort of the, the, the how and why, I kind of want to give you a little bit of a backstory about how this stuff all works. So um, a cookie is, is sort of synonymous with, I think, tags and pixels. You may have heard all three of those terms. Um, they're a little bit different in terms of how they actually operate. So a tag technically relies on what's called JavaScript code. Um, and that's something um, that basically does the same thing as a pixel but the pixel is, is represented as a one by one image. 
And depending on your browser, they can kind of be rendered differently in terms of the environment that your browser is running with. Um, but they basically both accomplish the same thing um, in, in the end. And when we think about this from first party and third party cookies, there's a huge difference. So Chrome is not gonna be getting rid of first party cookies. So first party cookies are generally used for website functionality. Um, they're generally really important and that's something that um, won't be impacted. So oftentimes, let's say if you're signing into a website or something like that, you know, you say like, remember me on this device, something like that. That's a first party cookie that's that's setting that code and saying, hey, this is this person. When they come back, your browser remembers it. You know, they say like, hey, Brian, um, welcome to, to, your, to your website, et cetera. Um, and that's also things where if you, let's say you add something to your cart and you're an e-commerce uh, website or something, that's how cookies remember that you've got something in your cart. Um, that's how they are able to say when you log back in, you still left something in your cart, et cetera. None of that's going to be impacted. Um, third party cookies, however, are going to be different. And that's where those are really used for ad targeting and ad measurement. And third party cookies are set all over the place. Um, and that's probably part of the reason why, why we're, we're running into this issue is because you really don't have much control unless you're using ad blockers or um, cookie blockers, et cetera, clearing your cookies all the time in terms of what's out there. Um, and that's, that's sort of like a, a big reason why things are changing. And that's going to be the hardest thing, I think, for folks who rely on this um, for digital businesses to, to, to target and generate revenue, um, because it's going to be a, a, a pretty momentous change. And when we're talking about this from a targeting perspective, um, the way that cookies typically work right now is uh, whether you're viewing an ad or clicking on an ad, essentially, you know, the, you would go through to a consumer, or you'd visit a website, you'd complete some sort of a conversion event. And when you clicked on that ad, um, that pixel that's on the, in your browser is going to send the data to the ad platform, letting you know that, letting the ad platform know that a conversion event happened. And basically when that happens, when you first make that click or that impression, it's setting a unique cookie ID in your browser. And then when you hit the website and then you make that conversion event, that transfers that information back to the ad platform. And this is pretty much ubiquitous across all platforms, whether you're using Facebook, Google, et cetera. Um, and that's something where it's going to basically allow us as marketers to say, hey, this is an ad that converted. Um, this is the timestamp of when the ad was clicked or the impression was served. This is the timestamp of the conversion event. This is the content of the ad. All that information is passed back through IDs that are then translated into um, campaign names, ad group names, creative names, et cetera. And that allows people to make optimizations from an ad perspective um, to understand what's working. But that's also something where from a data perspective, targeting users, um, the, whole, the whole world of third-party data is out there where we have the ability to um, infer interest because people will have done, you know, based on essentially browsing history where, well, you may go to a website to say, look at mortgage rates or something like that. Um, if you accept cookies on that website, that website may or may not have um, placed you into a bucket of consumers who are interested in possibly refinancing or buying a home something like that. So that then data is sold to ad platforms where people can target that if you are a mortgage broker or lender and say, hey, this person is, is probably interested in a uh, mortgage refinance. That's because um, they showed up on this site and we serve those ads to them. If that person clicks and they come back and convert for a quote or something like that, um, you can tie all of that together. But um, the way that this works from an ad impression standpoint is someone doesn't have to necessarily click onto a uh, onto an ad in order for that to happen. So if an ad impression is served, you can set that cookie ID. And this is also sort of the premise for how remarketing works, where if you are on a web page, um, let's say I'm on you know just a, a, a standard retailer's web page, um, and I'm looking at products, um, that's where cookies are set um, at the advertiser level on your website. And say I'm looking at a pair of shoes or something like that. If I leave and I go to another website, say I'm on CNN.com or something like that, that's how they're able to serve ads back to me because that cookie has a, um, a, a page view ID, a cookie ID, um, a product ID, et cetera. And then when I'm out, off on, the, um, uh, on another website, you're using cookies to, to serve those ads, a very highly targeted ad to somebody based on sort of what they're looking at. So it not only impacts what we call prospecting, so finding new audiences, which is like the previous mortgage example, but also remarketing, where we're saying people who are on your website to find someone on a different website that's not your own, that relies on third-party cookies. 
So definitely going to be um, a big issue. So there are a couple of different ways that um, all the different app platforms are working to combat this. And the biggest one um, that seems to be sort of the, the, the most popular right now is something that's called server to server integrations and also maybe called conversion APIs. And so um, you kind of see two events happening in parallel here, right? So server to server is something that doesn't rely on a browser to send tracking information. Um, it definitely requires a little bit more of a technical setup and there um, you know, maybe some additional costs in, incurred on something like this. And obviously you, know, you still have sort of the same um, issue for, for privacy. But the way that this works is, let's say I go to, let's say I'm retargeted by those shoes, I decide to buy them, I go to the website, the retailer's website, um, I click on that ad, I come to the website, I complete a conversion. If you have a conversion API or server-to-server -server integration set up, now you're going to have two actions happening in parallel. The cookie, as long as they are still supported from the app platform, will still send that data over. Um, and it will include, um, you know, all of the things about my device, et cetera, as much as they can. Um, and it won't include any sort of like personally identifiable information or anything like that from the cookie. But there's also a server to server integration that's set up where essentially um, all of my PII would, would be um, hashed. So in a privacy compliant way, it's something that is hashed sort of in your browser. And then all of that event data is sent over to the ad platform as well. And all of these ad platforms have um, what are called um, identity graphs, and they're all really good. So Google knows a lot about us all. Uh, Facebook knows a lot about us all because of, if you're a Facebook user, we, we give them that information. That information can be translated, that first party um, um, private uh, PII can be translated back to a device ID and also record the conversion. And so this is something where if, if cookies completely go away, that's another way for e-commerce transactions or anything where there's a PII exchange can be used to still um, track a conversion, but it's in a different sort of mechanism. So there's a couple of different options here. Um, Google's option, what they're calling is, is enhanced conversions. And it's, a, it's, a, it's basically your server to server where you're taking that data, you're sending it over to Google in their way. Um, Meta has their own uh, option of something that's been out for a while now, but they call it the conversions API. Um, and that's something where um, you basically are taking that information and sending it over to Facebook for their identity graph to, to map this stuff. TikTok has something as well. They call it their events API. But basically all of these things are running where it doesn't rely on a browser anymore, but it's taking that information from a server. The app platform still know that they served an ad to you. Um, this is now just something where they're seeing a conversion happen, um, even if a cookie can't pass it through. But all the platforms are recommending using both a combination of a pixel slash tag and server to server for as long as possible. Um, and I think that they probably want to gather as much data as they can um, to sort of strengthen their solutions before cookies completely go away um, so that we can still have really great options for targeting and attribution. But that's not everything that's there. So in addition to sort of like the, the what we call like the walled gardens, um, so Google, Facebook, TikTok, et cetera, um, they don't really share data with each other. Whereas the open internet um, is has a, a lot of different solutions that are kind of being kicked around. But one of the ones that seems to be the most promising and leading solutions for how um, a framework would be built is something that's called Unified ID 2.0. And this is something that was developed by the Trade Desk, which is a preeminent DSP that, that we use at Ataxi. But um, it's, it's, we think it's a, it's a great solution where essentially it combines um, the, it, all, all of the different sort of ways that folks would interact. So from publishers to supply side platforms, um, to measurement data providers, those third party data providers where you know, I'm looking at the mortgage rate, et cetera, um, demand side platforms, how we're doing all of this, um, to bidding to essentially reach people, data onboarding partners, um, where if you wanted to say like suppress your current uh, customers so you don't serve them ads, um, and then also the individual advertisers sort of works across all these different environments. But it's also a framework that works not only for um, web and mobile, but also connected TV. And connected TV is really interesting because that technology is is basically has been cookieless ever since, right? So ever since it sort of came came to um, came into existence, it's all relied on a third party mechanism, generally around an email address. Where if you're going to sign up for Roku, uh, Hulu, et cetera, 
Um, that's that first party data that is being used. Um, there's no cookies involved on the CTV side of things. So what's cool about um, UID 2.0 is it's privacy compliant, but it can also, it also works um, and there's consumer choice. So as an alternative, basically when you think about it as in a simplified way, as an advertiser, you have CRM data. So you can take your CRM data, you can work with platform partners that can translate that into these UID 2.0s, and then you can activate them for targeting and measurement right now. We're actually doing this today. Um, the way that the infrastructure works is it takes those email addresses um, it, it essentially works to, to transform them into an encrypted identifier that can then be used to um, target someone across the internet while still protecting the PII, but then consumers have choice. And so as consumers, the way this works is consumers log in to access content from publishers. Um, publishers are able to have a mechanism that's all open source um, through UID 2.0 sort of um, channels where you can convert that to a UD 2.0, make it available for advertisers for both targeting and for measurement. And in a slightly more complex, the way that this works is as a consumer, you'll be able to opt out, you can view data usage, you can change your preferences at any time. But let's say I log into a website, um, I would go in and verify an email and I can set my privacy preferences, right? So that privacy preference would be with that publisher, but it would also work for anybody that's in the network. And so that, individual email is hashed and so hashing is is something where it's a it's a one-way transaction um that is a, um, a secure hashing algorithm that's developed by like the nsa essentially you take that that email address and it turns it into a massive alphanumeric string that becomes your hash id but then they take a step further and they salt it which is um an extra form of protection so that you now have a complete unique identifier that's only to you but it's nothing that anybody can tie back to you um, so it's sort of like a one-way street there. Um, and then that is then used where um, that unified ID now, as you're um, going across publishers that have adopted UID 2.0, can be used for targeting. And that's something where um, trusted participants are the only ones who can access this sort of decryption key. And it's not a decryption to say that it's something where we know that this is Brian or Brian's email address. It's saying that oh, we can we can target this UID and that's what will pop pipe into the ad ecosystem. And if this sounds like this is something that's um, really far fetched, it's actually something that's been uh, happening for a while now. Uh, obviously, 2.0 would have been further. There's a 1.0, um, but it's something that's been going on for a while. And you can kind of see here the support is growing like crazy. So um, not only most of the largest sort of industry leaders have supported this. So the IAB, um, NAI, Prebit is the is the uh, organization that's that's supporting this. Um, tons of large agencies. You can see all the different publishers, Disney Plus, Disney just announced that they were using this for Disney Plus, um, all kinds of different data measurement partners, all kinds of different supply sides and demand sides, um, and then also um, uh, various other parts of infrastructure such as AWS, Salesforce, Oracle, et cetera. Um, all of these things are, are sort of in place, um, which is great. And this is sort of how in a future cookie-less world, we'd have to actually feel like we're really well prepared to not only be able to still offer the same level of sort of targeting and attribution that we get, um, but also do it in a very privacy compliant way that gives consumers more of a choice in terms of what they're doing um, and, and how their data is being used. So some really cool stuff there. And while they're, you know, the third party cookies is definitely something that's gonna be impact, um, we, are, we feel like we are incredibly well prepared for this. So with, everything that's changing um, when you think about attribution that's going to change as well too right so we've talked about how people are measuring what's happening on website properties but then also how are we going to measure media so with with any time we're going to have signal loss um we expect to have to have changes in how we're going to be measuring things and so i kind of touched on this a little bit of sort of like some of the attribution models that in ga4 that are available the first sort of um, five here from last touch to first touch, linear position based and time decay. These are really more like cross channel sort of attribution models where um, you're just basically saying, hey, well, this is how I want to give credit, whether it's last touch, that means it gives 100% of the credit to, um, a com to the last touch point that any sort of attribution model would see. Um, with Google Analytics, with universal analytics, that is only going to be from a specific device. Um, with GA4, that would be across devices. So um, someone might interact on a website uh, um, uh, with their desktop and then differently on a mobile, you might convert on a mobile. 
that would give last touch credit to to whatever happened through that mobile device. Um, same thing for first touch, um, where 100% goes to, goes to the first touch. That the the, the, um, the the ecosystem can see um, linear would be basically giving equal credit across um, uh, across all touch points. Um, position based sort of in terms of an attribution model is going to reward sort of more of a first touch and a last touch and then give the remaining touch points in between sort of equal credit. Um, all of these have their sort of um, benefits in terms of how you're looking at things, but also kind of have their drawbacks. Um, personally, I'm um, becoming more and more in favor of a time decay type of a model, um, just at least in terms of how we're looking at um, transactions where you're saying, you know, well, it may not get last touch credit if something happened just before the last touch credit, especially if you're using affiliate marketing or something like that, you still want to give it its, its due credit. Um, ultimately, data driven is probably the best. And that's where, as I mentioned earlier, um, something that's going to be really cool in GA4 where you're looking at more incrementality. Um, but the biggest challenge with all of these is that unless you're looking at an environment where you're looking at both clicks and impressions, it's really hard um, to, to tie everything together. And there used to be some really great tools out there um, prior to the iOS. Facebook had an awesome tool called Facebook Attribution, where you could actually pull in um, impression data. You could pull in from other platforms, not just Facebook, and you could do some really cool stuff with multi-touch attribution and tie all of this stuff together. That went away, um, and these things are going to continue to go away as we have more and more signal loss. And um, that's something where you know it's going to hurt folks from a standpoint of trying to decide, okay, well, what, what can I see? What can I track? What, what are the actions I want to take? Multi-touch attribution is something that's going to be even harder, I think, without when you have sort of more signal loss. Um, but we're probably going to end up seeing something that I, I think is um, sort of a resurgence of media mix modeling. Um, but that's going to be smarter media mix modeling than sort of what we've been used to. I think we kind of you know, had, it, had it great for a while when we were able to use MTA. Um, MMM is probably coming back. And something that's really cool that is out there that um, I think is probably like a, a future or at least an example of how this would work is something that's actually from Facebook. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's something they're calling Project Robin, but basically it's an, an example of intelligent media mix modeling. What's cool about this is it's open source. Um, it uses their profit library, which is a great data science library that they have. Um, it can kind of look at trends, seasonality, holiday patterns, um, it gives you multiple different models that can give you actionable insight for decision making, and it's private by design. The best part about this is it's not cookie dependent at all, no pixel data either. Um, it's something where it's privacy, you don't have to send in any PII. <coughs> Excuse me. But if you want to check it out, um, you can look at that. There's the GitHub link right there for Facebook if you want to see what they're, what they're doing. Sorry. Talk too fast and not drinking enough water. All right, so in conclusion, I want to leave you with some advice, um, things that you can do to uh, be prepared. Um, highly recommend, you know, looking at all of the tactics um, that you can adopt to gain insights in this cookie, this world, right? So make sure you're working with the right partners, um, people who have flexible, robust, and open buying capabilities to leverage all the available data that's out there. Someone like us, Ad Taxi, a uh, little plug there. Um, Building your own resources is is going to be hugely important. First party data is going to be critical more than ever, right? It's already gold. It's 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 the standard right now, um, but it's something that you should really invest in. Build and nurture those consented relationships with your consumers. Try and get as much first party data as you can from your consumers because it's going to be crucial in reaching them um, in the future, more so than today. And most importantly, take action when you're looking at um, Right now, definitely dual deploy GA4 if you haven't already. Set up as much of the server to server tracking capabilities as you can already, um, and just just you know you don't want to be left behind. So these are all things that I think would be sort of great um, advice for every business out there. And if you want to learn more, um, or if you have any questions, we're more than happy to talk. We love talking about this stuff. Um, please feel free to drop us a line, um, and then you can also learn more about GA4 again. Um, at adtaxi.com forward slash solutions forward slash GA4. So thank you all very much for your time today. I will pass it back to Sherry. All right. Thanks so much, Brian. Lots of lots of information, lots of things that are changing. Um, so I think that hopefully everybody can can learn a bit and uh, work towards getting prepared for what's coming coming in the future.
Well, that is it for us today. So thanks again for joining us and have a good day.